let's talk about Nordics. All right, so we all know about Valiant Thor. Most of you should. That's an actual picture of Valiant Thor. And um, he, uh, uh, I'm going to capsulize the story into a, a, a short paragraph. So Valiant Thor came here on March 16th, 1957, and he departed on March 16th, 1960. Um, he came to uh, mentor President Eisenhower on the ways of the universe to talk to him about um, eliminating sickness, disease, how to prolong life, to talk to him about atomics and how it's, it's not only affecting the earth, but interdimensional uh, realities and uh, everything across our galaxy as well. And um, uh, now he was prophesized, not prophesized, but there were, there were beings, there were Nordics that came many, many years before he was coming. And they, they told him to tell the president that, um, that a universal emissary was coming. Um, Valiant Thor didn't know when it was because he, as Dr. Frank told me, he was living on the interior of Venus at the time, waiting for the call. Um, so I'm sure it was the president even before Eisenhower that was alerted, that then became alerted to uh, um, Eisenhower. And um, anyway, so he lived and worked at uh, NASA, I mean, um, the Pentagon, and he actually helped NASA in its beginning stages um, my personal opinion, just so you know, I feel very connected to him and his crew because I did the short film. They were around me a lot. I never met them, but I've had some miracles happen uh, because of them. And um, so I truly believe that he is still there guiding NASA. Now, you know, some people get terrified thinking that a being is, you know, they're manipulating the earth with NASA. It's, it's the exact opposite. He is a created being. He doesn't have a belly button. He is an angelic of the seraphim order. That is what I truly believe. Now, I know he's an angelic, and I know that there is a man that works at NASA that actually says... I work for the hammer and the hammer works for God. So um, that's pretty cool. All right. So now, all right. So let's just go into some of the things. So we know the Nordic race began in the ancient Lyra system. And when reptilians found their worlds and warred with them, they spread out across the universe, mainly into Vega, the Pleiades, Sirius, Alpha Centauri, Antares, etc. cetera. Um, now, Agarthans living on Earth beneath the surface, uh, surface are ancient races that came in the times of Lemuria and Atlantis, um, and, and before that as well, but this is when a large number of them came. Although um, they are spread out under the Earth, their cities are interlinked by these amazing quick bullet trains that get you there in a fraction of the time. Now, the capital of Agartha is Shambhala the Greater, located beneath the Himalayas. Posid is the Atlantean capital, located beneath the Mato Grosso in Brazil. And Telos, the Lemurian capital, is located beneath Mount Shasta. Now, there are many races that live in harmony and are fully conscious that live uh, in Agartha. And each city has a Melchizedek master, some male, some female, some both, to teach the masses. Now, what is Melchizedek? It's the universe's university that has 490 schooling planets from one end of the galaxy to the other. Planets 22 and 23 are where star seeds are trained before their incarnation missions in which that is where Tehran is part of that. Um, he teaches uh, classes there for um, 
uh, star seeds who are going to come here and just raise personal consciousness and star seeds who are coming here to raise consciousness for the masses. All right, now, these are Alpha Centaurians. Now, these are actual renditions from the Ricardo Gonzalez case. The artist's name is Romero Rossi. He allowed me to use these, um, his renditions, you know, and working with Ricardo. Now, there are many, many people in Brazil who have been contacted by Antaral, who is the male. Ivica is his female counterpart. Um, he is eight feet tall. And, um, and it's fascinating. So in my documentary, I have another, uh, another uh, contactee who has been on their ships over a hundred times. So what he has to say about the Alpha Centauri's uh, Alpha Centaurians is going to blow your mind. Um, now, they, uh, they, they call them in Brazil, they call them Apunians. It's because when they landed first, they landed near the mountain called Apu. And Apu means Lord Protector and Spirit of the Mountain. So, um, Let's see here. There we go. All right. Now, what's interesting is they have these incredible things called Zendras. And a Zendra is a portal. But this portal is different than what we would think of a portal. Is that it is generated, it's like a, a half circle. And if you were standing on, on one side and they were on the other side and they were on their ship, if you stepped into the Zendra, you were actually standing in their ship. If they were on their planet, you'd be standing on their planet. It's a very interesting concept of how it's explained from all of these various contactees. Um, now, I'm going to tell you just a quick little story. I, uh, uh, one of my dearest friends went uh, to one of Ricardo Gonzalez's meetings um, and they were at Sand Flats, was a big open space with a view of Mount Shasta. And um, Ricardo said that they were going to come and show everybody. Uh, they were going to bring the ship in low and that there were going to be a small number of people that were going to be invited to meet on Tyrol. And so they, they were all gathered, uh, you know, towards the end of the day. They all did a beautiful meditation. They got up, they started singing, they started chanting, they started laughing. That is the power of bringing in extraterrestrial beings of a higher nature, right? So um, after that happened, the ship came in, it went over the pine trees and lit up the forest, my friend said. And, um, and then the small group went into the forest and Everyone was told to go back to camp, but my friend stayed literally 100 feet away to watch. And he saw the Zendra open up. And, um, and then 20 minutes later, each person came walking out one by one. And he said it was like what, what must have been like when Moses talked to the burning bush. Um, it affected all of them in so many different ways. One, two people freaked out totally. Um, and others were just uh, walked away with this great realization that there are these incredible beings in space that are here to help us, who love us. And, um, and they're here in that manner to show us that they're actually real. They're not here to do it for us. They're here to share wisdom if you're open to receiving that wisdom. All right. And what's really beautiful about these Alpha Centaurians is they do go and check in on all the small communities in the outer reaches in Brazil uh, where they don't have medicine. Uh, if it hasn't rained, their crops won't grow. So they do come in and they'll, they'll create some rain. Um, they'll heal their sick and they'll do this, um, uh, you know, uh, um, 
effortlessly, uh, you know, in, they come in uh, short intervals just to make sure that they're all okay. So that's another reason too, while there's so many um, beautiful experiences and people who are um, uh, so many contactees in Brazil. All right, now we're gonna talk about Pleiadians. All right. There it goes. There we go. All right. So, uh, of course, Pleiadians look like blonde Nordics, right? Uh, Pleiadians, Andromedans, Syrians, Octurians are a huge part of the consciousness raising programs on Earth. Vegans as well. Males are extremely tall, anywhere from 6'5 to 8 feet. Um, females are 5'9 to 6'5 on average. Um, they're one of the races that have seeded the planet with their genetics in our past. And like I said before, they feel a deep connection to us. So they're concerned for our future, knowing, knowing that failing fates of many worlds, and they're here to help us to understand duality is a tool to become fully conscious so that we can become conscious and take care of our planet. They're not going to do it for us right? This is our home. We have to take care of it. Um, my Tehran books um, are, like I said before, are a tool for understanding this duality. And um, so, like I said, by the end of book three, you, you will be Tehran. This is a picture of Tehran here with short hair, not long hair. Um, by the end of book three, you will become conscious along with Tehran as well. So just so you know, the Galactic Kingdom shares all of their technology. If one race comes up with a new idea, it's shared. Now they're telepathic in a very unique way. And they started this telepathy with me when they began waking me up and I began writing. Because when they talk to you in your head or show you pictures in your head that they actually share their feeling body with you. So if they're telling you a story, you're feeling their emotions right along with it. And what they do is they come in and they just kind of sit inside you. And sometimes it's so, I mean, sometimes it's so beautiful. Again, I just sob and sob and sob and sob because you just can't believe how beautiful they are. They have no secrets from each other. Um, everything is based on truth, trust, unconditional love. And that is because everyone knows who everyone is from the deepest core of their soul. And that's unbelievably incredible. Um, now, uh, so the good news is now, are there, are there malevolent human races? Of course there are. There are renegade Pleiadians. There's renegades from all different races as well. Can a fully conscious being be corrupted? Yes, of course they can be corrupted. Can a created being be corrupted? Well, we know that's true uh, from Lucifer and all of the angels that followed him as well. And there are many other stories um, about beings that have in the past. So, um, so just remember this one simple saying that they all the positive races want you to know is to judge the individual, don't judge the race. Okay. All right. Now we're going to move on. Oh, I just want to tell you this really quick. So William Tompkins worked in the think tank at Douglas Aircraft in Santa Monica during uh, the time uh, he became the chief of engineering for the Saturn V moon rocket. And at that time, Nordics came and began working alongside him for four years. Now get this. This is, a, this is an amazing statement that he made. He says that the Nordics came here to help humanity conceive and build starships so that we may join the Nordic Navy battle groups in space to resolve our shared reptilian problem. That's a powerful statement. All right, this is somebody who actually was watching the moon landing as well. 
and uh, that there were giant reptilian ships that were spotted there as well. All right, so let's go on to the UFO hotspot book. All right, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna just give you a little background. So. Uh, So when MUFON Books approached me to write this book, they said, what we want to do is send out a letter to all the MUFON state directors and ask them to nominate their favorite UFO hotspots. So after I compiled everything um, and I added a few of my own, I began to write the book. So what you get in the book is uh, you get the when, the where, the detailed story behind it, things to do when visiting the site, uh, sources of the places to see, including contact numbers, local guys who will take you to obscure locations and much more. Um, now, also at the end, in some of these cases, um, the, uh, the sources are from MUFON investigator books um, and I worked with a lot of them who uh, investigated things and even currently reopened one like Chris Stiles did on the UFO Harbor incident up in uh, Canada. Um, and then I give you also MUFON and Project Blue Book summation on the cases as well. And I will tell you, you're going to find some of that very interesting. All right. And what's also cool is you're going to get the quadrants to where Adamski met Orthon, where Lonnie Zamora saw the ship and the two alien beings, uh, Travis Walton's abduction site, and where Valiant Thor's starship is parked at Lake Mead. So if you're ever in those areas, you can just punch in the quadrants and you can go visit uh, the areas as well. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with Giant Rock and the Integratron. This is my favorite place. I've heard about the Integratron for so many years and all the incredible stories people have told me when visiting there, seeing craft around there, um, feeling that beings that were inside there were not from this earth, etc. cetera. Um, so George Van Tassel ran this airport. And at the bottom left, that's Frank Kreitzer. He was the first man to run the airport. He dynamited under Giant Rock and built his home. And this was the doors that he built to go down inside. We're going to see inside in the next slide, so not to worry. And, um, and then after Frank passed away, uh, George took over the airport. He brought his wife, Eva, and his two daughters, and they lived under the rock. But George mostly slept outside uh, when it was hot. And um, uh, so he began, he really wanted to live a spiritual life. That's why he wanted to be in the middle of the desert and just get away from it all. And so he began um, meditating and suddenly began channeling beings that were not of this earth. I actually have all those channelings. I put some of them in the book. He was the very first man to channel Ashtar, uh, by the way. And um, so my dear friend, Athena, who was then known as Denise, she was there for the very first channelings with George and so I was able to get all of the information from the horse's mouth, right? Now, uh, Bob Short was also there during those first channelings. His story was interesting. He was connected to space beings and they kept telling him to go find Big Rock. He didn't know what that was. So he just started driving. They told him to go which, which direction. And he would stop and then he eventually found giant rock and told George the story. So he was there for those first channelings as well. And he became a channeler. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a minute. Now, um, okay. So George then in 1953, he was sleeping outdoors 
and he heard someone approaching and he woke up and he went to greet the fellow. He was five, six, short blonde hair in a space suit and um, introduced himself as Saul Gonda. And George saw his ship not that far away and uh, he invited him to tour his ship. Now, George had worked for Howard Hughes and McDonnell Douglas, so he was very fascinated with that. He went on the ship. All the other men on the ship were also five, six, with short hair uh, in suits. And, um, uh, and then Salgonda gave him the blueprints to build a building called the Integratron. Now, Howard Hughes gave uh, George $20,000 to start, but George had to raise money to complete the building uh, of this uh, beautiful structure. Now, the structure was just like what Valiant Thor came with the information, was if you walked in when the building is turned on and moving, uh, there's a, a spin mechanism that raises up and starts the, these coils and things that used to be on the top of the, uh, the first floor roof that you could walk from in one door out the other and your cells would be totally rejuvenated and you would no longer have sickness or disease and it would prolong your life. So... Um, George had to figure out ways of raising money. So he started doing um, UFO um, conferences in the middle of the desert. So these other two pictures to the right are pictures of um, all the people that were there listening, the podium on the bottom right. Uh, George would speak up there. Interestingly enough, the first time I went there to the Integratron was with Dr. Frank Stranges. And he told me and the sisters that own it, he goes, oh yeah, I used to MC all of uh, the space conventions there. And that was something I didn't know. And so uh, anyway, I thought that was really interesting. Now let's see, let's go down below. So here, the bottom two are uh, with Frank Kreitzer. Right, so you see where those doors were before. Those are the steps you would walk down. This is here. Um, this is where he had his little kitchen and a table. The top two are from Life Magazine. There's many more if you want to look them up on the internet. Um, they came out and did a whole story on the Integratron when George was there. So this is what it looked like, and that was George's book collection. And, you know, as you can see, people could come in and be comfy and sit in a chair, that kind of thing. All right. Now, this is, all right. So Sheriff Ackerman, um, he did not believe in UFOs or anything, but he was hired in case, you know, any, anything got out of control, which it didn't. And he actually took this photograph uh, over... Um, giant rock. And uh, from that day forward, he said that he was a believer. And um, anyway, it, it's the, uh, it looks like the emulsion around the ship coming through interdimensionally. I've caught many things with plasma and things like that that are around things on film as well. Um, all right. Let's see if I've forgotten anything. Nope. Oh, okay. All right. So now let's move on to the Integratron. This is George Van Tassel, uh, upper left. Uh, and this is Denise, who is now known as Athena. That's what she looked like back then. And um, I, uh, there was never an artist rendering done of Orthon, so I hired an artist to do one. And um, I, I listened to everything George had to say. I had access to the Integratron archives, you know, of course, all the information from Athena and Bob Short, who were there from the beginning. Athena is still alive, by the way. Uh, Bob just passed away a few years ago. And um, so I took everything of what he said he looked like and had this artist rendering done so people can see what it's like. So... Um, let's see. 
All right. Now, this is what the Integratron looks like on the outside. This is the second floor, which is a sound chamber. And I will tell you, it is the most unbelievable experience when you're laying there on those beautiful mats and they do the singing bowls, you feel like you're levitating. And if you're standing at one end and somebody else is standing on the other end, if you whisper, hello, on the other side, you're, you'll hear, hello. It's really, really fascinating. Um, I've been there so many times, I can't tell you. I mean, I really feel myself being rejuvenated there, just being in this, uh, under this dome. And, um, you know, once when I was there, uh, the Gregorian chanters from Italy came to record their album inside the dome. And they wanted to know if they could uh, uh, chant a song for us. And I have to tell you, it was the most unbelievable experience because all of their voices were being thrown all over. It was so multidimensional. It was absolutely beautiful. All right, let's move on to um, now. This is Bob Short. And we took Bob out there in 2013. He hadn't been there in many, many years to channel for the very first time in a long, long time. And that's him sitting in the chair. Um, and uh, in one photograph, uh, there was a, um, a disc above Giant Rock as well. We went over to, um, you can see me in the background in the top photo there. Um, Bob Short is talking to Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone was George Van Tassel's um, son-in-law, and that's his son, Matthew, in the background there in the red shirt. And um, he told us so much uh, about the day that George met Salgonda from where he was living there. You could see right across the desert, and he saw the ship, and he said he went and talked to George right afterwards and heard everything uh, right from, uh, right from the time. I will tell you, Daniel Boone had the most angelic eyes I've ever seen. They were crystal blue and he was just an amazing human being. All right. Now we're going to go into something a little more. We're going to go into some, we got a little light, a little dark, a little neutrality for you guys here. All right. So I'm just going to name off the things. Okay, first of all, that's what the Bradshaw Ranch looked like in its heyday, right? And you see the little tree by the house. That's called the, an alligator tree because its bark looks like an alligator skin. And that says Linda Bradshaw, who is married to Bob Bradshaw. That's why it's called the Bradshaw Ranch. Uh, she was his second wife. She said it was an interdimensional portal for positive and negative beings, right? And up here, right above it, you can see the windmill, which is off in the distance. If people were standing or sitting or meditating near the windmill, they uh, some people would have missing time, right? So, um, so on this ranch, there are stories of reptilians, greys, portals with... Uh, Linda's son using a video camera with the VHS back in the day, where when you look through the viewfinder, what was in the viewfinder was not what was in front of you with the naked eye. Once he saw a dinosaur, he also saw a telephone pole that wasn't there, and also regular pink pigs uh, roaming around. Now, there's no pink pigs in uh, Sedona. There's only javelina. So um, anyway, that was interesting. Uh, uh, albino Bigfoot as well. Uh, in the middle of broad daylight, in the front of the ranch, on the other side of what you're seeing there, is um, where a ship landed right in front of Bob. And Bob freaked out, went back in the house, and told his wife he wants nothing to do uh, with any of her investigations or anything like that. It just freaked him out too much. Um, so he never participated in any investigations. Now, um, 
one on um, one of my dear friends actually worked at the Bradshaw Ranch in its working days. And she's the one who told me all these stories about the albino Bigfoot, about the greys, the reptilians. She told me UFOs. I mean, everything you can think of. She was telling me these stories. And, you know, you have to uh, remember, this is sits just outside of Sedona. If you don't know how to get there, you're never going to get there. It is like so remote in the Verde Valley and you have to drive down a wash for quite some time and on the sides are nothing but trees and bushes. So when I went there the first time, my friend uh, who worked there took me, we were walking down the wash because we couldn't get the car down there. You have to have a four wheel drive and um, I could literally feel the dimensions opening up. I've had that ever since I was a child. I could see spirit. I could see it moving. And um, so I was feeling all these dimensions opening up and everything told me to turn around and go the other way. But it was broad daylight. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just going to go for it. And I went and we walked around the perimeter of the ranch and you can kind of look in and see everything and and you know she explained everything to me so but then um i uh, every time i go to sedona i go to their bookstores and see if tom dongo is a new book out he's sort of like the big ufo guy there who knows everything he's been there for years and years he actually investigated the ranch for four years with linda so then i hooked up with him to uh uh, put this into the section of the UFO hotspot. Um, and he was kind enough to give me some of these great uh, photos, including the one you're seeing here now. Um, so I'm going to just give you a few of these little stories and then we'll move on to the, some of these other slides. Um, Linda said at night uh, their dogs were barking outside. She went outside uh, and they were barking at something that wasn't there looking up. And she heard um, a real heinous hissing. And she said it freaked her out so much she got the dogs in the house. They went out there the next morning and they found reptilian footprints. So evidently it was an interdimensional. I know about these because I photographed one in a case, an abduction case, and it's in the back of the Extraterrestrial Species Almanac book. All right, now Grays, uh, once they landed their ship in the middle of the night, Linda's son, his girlfriend, and the girlfriend's young daughter, were staying on one of the homestead houses way out deep in the ranch. And all of a sudden, little grays were running around and they were watching them uh, through the window, totally freaking out, flipping out. And, um, and then after quite some time, they were able to run to the car, get in the car, run, come up to the big ranch. And he woke his mother up and she came out in the living room uh, they made coffee and were having coffee and immediately they looked out uh, the window and a gray literally was walking across the front of the window. Linda has no fear. She ran out there to uh, see it, but it just vanished. Right. So um, anyway, uh, but I love the story of big girl uh, who is the albino uh, Bigfoot. Um, she, she had a, a, Linda had a mare who was pregnant and she would find, uh, these white hairs on her stomach every day. And, um, and then Tom called her and said, you know, really beware because you have to protect her because, um, all the other ranches are reporting that grays or reptilians are stealing their mares, uh, fetuses. And, um, so Linda thought, well, maybe, maybe this is, uh, we, we, she saw Bigfoot prints always, you know, out by the, uh, the stables. Um, so she decided to uh, put some fruits and vegetables out on a plate and put it up on the ledge and um, for this Bigfoot. And uh, the next morning um, she went out, all the food was gone. And as we know, Bigfoot's gift, she found stones and sticks. And so she continued to feed her. And she really believed that she protected her mare 
at night from these greys or reptilians who were stealing the fetuses. Um, and uh, the baby was born and everything was fine. Um, Tom told me other times they'd be investigating at night. He took a picture um, and a man showed up in the picture who wasn't even there, right? Another interdimensional. Um, and anyway, it's just, it's such a great, fascinating story. Now, this is what the ranch looks like today, uh, dilapidated. And, um, you know, that's the backside of the ranch. This is a, a closer picture of the alligator tree, um, which is still alive considering it's in, you know, in the middle of the desert. And um, when you're around it, you totally feel the energies moving you and your body will spin like by itself, like, like this, or you might be rocking, it'll be very um, heavy. But Linda said, she knew when the dark energies came because things on the ranch started going badly. Like one night uh, they heard the, the trucks jumping in the front. They went out and they saw this and they saw this energy squeezing the sides of it and they took pictures and all of this blue energy was around it. Um, and uh, sometimes she felt negative energies, but she also felt very angelic energies come in as well. So she did feel protected. Um, all right, now this is what, that's what the front of the ranch looks like now. And right inside those broken windows is where they built a saloon. So the saloon had a bar, um, a stage for the band, uh, dancing tables and chairs. So, you know, Bob uh, create, had created a great thing. You know, you could do horseback riding on the ranch. Uh, you could come out for stagecoach shows with real stuntmen. You can come out and, you know, you have a barbecue, have some drinks and, uh, you know, in the saloon, um, all kinds of things. Uh, my friend who worked there said on the very first night of a new show, that right as it started, a giant UFO flew uh, low right over them. And she said it was just amazing. Now, she had seen craft before, um, so it didn't frighten her, but she said it was amazing to see. All right, now here's, this is the windmill uh, where it was missing time. There was a Japanese um, journalist who went there and he was missing for three hours and he didn't even know that he was missing whenever he returned, right? And they're like, you've been gone for three hours. And he's like, no, I haven't. So who knows where he went and what happened? Um, these were the little reptilian footprints. This is Linda Bradshaw. This is Tom Dongo. And here's uh, the information uh, about my website. You can get any of uh, my books, The Autobiography of Extraterrestrial Saga, the four-part book series on the, is on the homepage. And E.T. Almanac and uh, UFO Hotspots uh, in the tab if you click on Other Books. Um, as you know, I uh, did the Stranger at the Pentagon story. So... Um, I have uh, all of Dr. Frank's out of print books. Um, I only have like six DVDs left of the short film with extras. Um, so you can order that at strangeratthepentagon.com uh, where it says buy book and DVD. Um, we got posters of Valiant Thor. You see behind me are the posters, a movie poster, a Starship poster, Actually, uh, the Victor One poster, which is Valiant Thor's craft, um, his fleet is Victor One, Victor Two, II, Victor Three, and it, go, it keeps going up like that. And um, uh, so there's a actual poster that, which is great, that has the blueprints to uh, his Victor One craft as well. So, all right, so I'm gonna take, let's see. I take that off, stop.
There we go. All right. All right, guys. So that's the end of my presentation. Are you guys going to come back on or? Craig, absolutely awesome. Everything that you shared. But I've got to say the synchronicity story about your birth father was absolutely, yeah. that was mind blowing. Isn't it mind blowing? And, and it continues, you know, to blow my mind. Michelle, Tamara. <laughs> love you, love you, love you. I love you guys so much. Oh I love you know. too. I know. And, and, you know, it, it keeps on going. I mean, they, they welcome me into their family. Like they were just so happy. And, you know, I had my uncle do his DNA and then he goes, Oh, it showed right away. You know, we're connected. Cause I told him, I said, you know, we have Spanish blood. And he goes, no, we don't. And I go, yes, from your mother. And, uh, and then he goes, I'll be darn. We got Spanish, Greek, Italian, you know. So Craig, are you going to, are you going to found alien ancestry.com? Are you going to find I that? would love to because oh. Oh, I yeah. think, that is so good. There is a woman, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you guys have heard of Lavendar. Lavendar actually does um, charts and she can tell if you're a star seed or not by some aspect in a chart, which I find very fascinating. That's very so. interesting. Have you, are you familiar with Sarah Brexman, Craig? No. Okay, so she, um, she was taught QHHT, but Julia Cannon, Dolores Cannon's daughter, she mm -hmm. pretty much picked up she pretty much picked up the baton after Dolores Cannon and continued her work in regards to researching star seeds. She wrote a hypnosis guide to Atlantis, a hypnosis guide to Avalon, and a hypnosis guide to the Sphinx. And from her regressions, she's realizing that we have certain traits, even handprints, that dig, um, that specify what star races we're from. Really? And so ah. there's a shape on the hand, on our lines in the hands, that you can tell if you're incarnating in Atlantis. Those are the kind of things that she's learning from her regressions, which is, I thought was really are you, interesting. Are you, talking, yeah. are you talking about the the A and the M? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I have, an, I have an M. I have an I M. Have an M on this hand and an A on this hand. I don't know what the A means. Atlantis. <laughs> it's what? Atlantis. I don't know. I, I've got an A and I got an M. I've got yeah, so I, I feel like what do you have, Victor? An X. An X? Yeah. X Men. <laughs> X good. marks the spot. Yep. Yeah. Craig, so. it, it's always it's always so fun to listen to you tell your story over and over again. I I I always pick up something new, some little new tidbit from it, but I will never yeah. forget the bolt of lightning I felt in my heart when I met you at the Integratron. And oh my God, it was so great. It, it was such yeah. a, an epic moment, you know, where we were I both know. being prepared to meet each other. And that is my, you know, we call it the dome away from home. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and I literally found the pictures from that day the other day on my phone. I was searching for him while, while yeah. you were talking. I was looking yeah. for him because we have some great pictures. Yeah, it was so that, much fun. So much fun. Yeah. Greg, I wanted, I wanted to mention uh, about the short film that you did. It was phenomenal. And you won s some awards for it. Yeah, we, we got uh, best uh, sci-fi short <clears throat> on it. And then... Um, the ET Species Almanac documentary, um, you know, when that comes out, we'll put it in a bunch of festivals. Um, I do want to call What's the sisters. Um, probably in spring. In That's the spring. Soon. I don't have a release date yet because we're, we're literally just finishing it. And um, so I don't have the exact date, but, um, but you guys will know for sure you know, uh, when it's going to come out. I was thinking about calling the sisters and seeing if we do a screening, you know, inside the dome a couple times in one day, like we did with Stranger at the Pentagon. We did that because, you know, uh, that was really the, the, the giant rock is the birthplace of ufology. Yes. Literally. So, 
I thought it was, you know, cool to do it there. And it was jam packed the whole time. So, well, you remember you were there. I was there and it was, yeah. it was just epic. Can you and like, it's go ahead. I, I'm really looking forward to this. I think in the chat people were asking about you, um, asking about what the name of the documentary was. So it's ET Species Al ET Species Almanac documentary due out. This it, it's it's the, the the extraterrestrial species almanac. Okay, so here here's the opening sequence. You'll dig it, right? Mm -hmm. So Snake Girl, right? Where is she? Snake girl, right? She comes up, she goes shh, like this onto the screen and she's moving. And then it comes on the extraterrestrial species almanac. And then it goes the documentary. And when it says the documentary, her tongue goes bloop. Oh <laughs> 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 it's so great. It's so great. I can't tell you how many CGI people I went through to get that tongue right, but now it's right. It's, it's you know, it's very cool. So it kind of opens that up. It's an hour and a half. Um, it's like, it's like you've never seen anything like this before. Ever, ever, ever. Oh, I you can't know? wait. Yeah, I'm really, really, I'm really, really proud of it. And, um, you know, it's taken us several years to, you know, to do it. I mean, we were doing it in, during COVID and all of that. So uh, it's just a lot of work. People don't realize how much work goes into these things and, uh, you know, all of that. So, um, like I said, I'm hoping to show it at, uh, you know, the MUFON Symposium. Um, hoping to show it, hopefully, if I can get contact in the desert to show it and let it be a premiere yeah. there, you know. And by we're, the way- Eric and I are doing the Giant Rock tour for Contact in the Desert on Thursday, May 31st. Oh my God. Yeah, we do it every year, but this year, um, this year he's actually doing a, a workshop at the Integratron on the Monday after. Um, so he'll be doing his intensive after contact in the desert at the intensive. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. I would love to see you show it there. My gosh. Yeah, I know. I'm just waiting till I know that it's locked and, you know, I'm just finalizing all the other details with it. Well, I, <laughs> I encourage all of us here to hold that vision that you will have it locked and ready to go as soon as mm -hmm. cosmically possible. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. I wanna, I just wanna sit in the screening and like in the front and stare at the audience and watch their faces. <laughs> That's gonna be you great. Know? Oh, I, I was gonna ask for a teaser, but then when you said snake girl with the tongue, I mean, that's pretty good. Uh, I can't wait mm -hmm. to see that. You said you're going to do something with a bust or a, or a replica, a statue that's a big surprise too. Remember, you said you're working on something. A statue? Saying, don't say no. A little replica of a ET. No. Where did I, I get that? that? When we were, I don't know. Craig was you on my been heaven channel. Am I making stuff up? <laughs> you must have dreamt it. There's some Maybe it's a premonition. He's yeah. prophesizing. You said that you. It's, well, I, mean, I, I really, I, I'm really not having a, a senior moment, but I, I, I'm really pretty accurate. But I don't know where I got this. You said they're making a replica of Betty. Um, oh of Betty right, Hart. right. Yeah. Well, okay. Betty Ooh. Hill. Betty Hill made <laughs> made a replica of Junior, the being That's it. that she met. Now. Now there were there were like little Zetas on the ship, but Junior was different, right? Junior's eyes were a little Asian flared, and but the inside of the eyes was like a gecko's eyes. He had a wide nose, mouth, high cheekbones, no hair. Yeah. He had blue silver skin that was kind of like what we would think of as pock marks from acne, right? But I don't think that he had acne. But <laughs> so what we did is we had an artist take the bus 
and make a 3D rendering. That was it. And then we created him, you know, in artwork and then made him 3D. That's it. Yeah, that that's was the it. first that, that that's the first no one's ever done that you said and that I mean there's yeah. so many details I'm sure that you put into this and looking at what you've done in the past you're very detail oriented. I mean, this is going to be a game changer. And I did think about you. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to throw it out there, but I saw it on the Pluto channel. I, I guess it's owned by, what is it? The Peacock, but they had a documentary about the dome. And, and I just was like, what? They and I was did? like, what? Right, yeah. And they got a lot of the same pictures. You have similar pictures. And I'm like, I was like, what is that doing here? But it, they had it, they had it playing and you could, download it instantly because they have documentaries now on Pluto. So whenever you go through your oh cycle of whatever you're doing, your cycle and, you know, through your runs and your launch at some point, whenever you may want to contact. Uh, I wonder if that was like the cousin guy who was making a film. Um, I, I remember the sisters telling me, and I remember he had contacted me. So maybe that was him. It was like a cousin or something in the Van Tassel thing. It's a guy yeah. who was the um, the uh, shepherd of the dome for a long time till it was rehabilitated. And they went through that process and he works with the sisters. And I was just surprised to see it. They had the, uh, the herd ox on there. I yeah. was like, oh my gosh. And I was yeah. just, so, so they have a whole little category now called documentaries. Yeah. Where, where, where did you say that you it's saw on Pluto? It? It's that free channel, you know, Pluto, but I yeah. think it's owned by NBC I don't know about this or channel. whatever. Yeah. yeah. You can it's just free. app it on, app it on your TV. Yeah. It's a free, free yeah. app. Pluto. Yeah. Huh. P L U T O. And, and they had, was it Emil Canning that was on the guy who owned and sold it to the sisters? I think so. Yeah. He lives kind of yeah. on the land and he's friends with the, with the uh, sisters. And at one point someone broke in and trashed the place. He was upset. He was complaining about that, but there was, it was a lot more to it than that. It was old, nothing, but I was surprised to see that. Yeah on a regular channel, which is showing right. that you're, you know, that's a consciousness expanding thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which, you know. what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, Oh my God. I'm so glad to see all of you and see you again, Victor, my new friend, Victor. Your we're picture. both we're we're both like those we're we're the Pleiadian boys. Yeah, uh, Pleiadian boys. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, Fred, thank you so much, brother. You're and, welcome. Um, yeah, really excited for a documentary. We're going to be doing part two of ET Species Almanac presentation on Portal to Ascension this year as well. Yes. And I think you're going to combine it with UFO hotspots, right? Like a longer version. I, I will. We'll do okay. a longer version, more detailed, right. and, you know, we'll have different artwork and stuff like that. So. Beautiful. That's awesome. Excuse this, me. This is a great yes. start to 2024 hearing about the lineup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. Real, real quick. I just got a little announcement. Uh, my husband walked in and he he found the name of that thing for you. It's called Calling All Earthlings. Calling All oh, Earthlings. Oh, yes. Yeah, that, you know I that do. Guy. Now I remember that. Okay. I remember <laughs> that now. Yeah, but I, I want to watch it again. Do you, I remember oh, that yeah. guy. I, now I can't think of the name of the guy that made it. Can you remember, Craig? It's It was the cousin, I think. Maybe it was like, I think it was a cousin of, of Van Tassel. Like maybe one of his daughter's sons or something, because I know he made one, and I think, I think it was that. Um, let me hang on. Uh, uh, look, look on. Are you look typing it up? Look on IMDb. I bet you it's right. on there. Okay. Um, then everybody. Then Jonathan everybody. Who? Jonathan Berman. Yes, no, that's, that's, yeah, that's not that's not him. That's the director. It, it came oh, out June okay. 2018. And are you thinking of Chad? The this Chad was one of the cousins, I think. Was he lives that? in Mexico now. You're Is not he a I don't know, was but it, I remember when 
Jonathan Berman came out with that movie. It's it says just executive producer Alan Steinfeld. Yeah, there it is. Oh, no way. Really? Yeah. Alan? Castle. Of what? Of Calling All Earthlings? Calling All Earthlings. Calling All Earthlings. Yeah. Uh, no way. That, that yeah. so many things up his sleeve. You know, it's hard Man, to, hard to he gets around him. that out. It's on Prime no Video, way. too. <laughs> oh, it is? Okay, good. Yeah, Prime and Pluto. And yeah, I'm sure it's different places, but. Uh, yeah, and they just put on um, Amazon Prime um, Elizabeth Clarer's uh, documentary. Oh. Who, who um, she, she incarnated here um, and her, her uh, soul twin named Akon. Uh, started visiting her when she was young, when she was seven. Um, they, uh, uh, she became pregnant. He took her back to his planet during the pregnancy so the boy could be born there and live under those aspects. And so, uh, and then brought her back and she finished out her life to finish her mission talking about Akon and where he comes from. So it's a, wow. it's a real interesting story. Yeah. She's South African. What's the name of that? Oh, no, the film. Uh, what did I just say? Crap. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Clare. K L A R E R. Elizabeth Clare. Okay. Yeah. I found it. South African writer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Got it. Yeah. It's a, it's a name of the Beyond book. the Light Bearer. Yeah. That's it. Beyond okay. the Light Bearer. Yeah, and Ooh, there's supposedly an, there's okay. supposedly another documentary coming out about her as well. So, um, you know, hers is just a is just such a fascinating story because you know the pregnancy and the boy and all that. She's they they do a lot of interviews with her. And they do interview her son here and other people about you know their belief in it and that kind of thing. So. Nice. Yeah. Hey. Thank you for the recommendations. Always, always looking for something good to watch. You know? Yeah, <laughs> something new. We're gonna get it off. Yeah, <laughs> something new. Uh, Craig, thank yeah. you so much, brother. Appreciate You're you. welcome, you guys. Thank oh, you so much. You. So love lovely you, to see you love all. Love you, Craig. We'll be seeing you at Conscious Life. Will What's you be that? at Conscious Life Expo? When's that? Um, when, when is it? February, 9th, February. 10th, something like that. Oh, right I'll probably go. Valentine's. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll probably go for sure. We'll see you. See yeah. you soon. Okay. Thank yes. you for such a great yeah. presentation. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Fantastic. guys. Bye.